So, um, um, one of the things that uh, not everybody knows is the way Jason and I met. Um, I'm just curious, just because I'm curious, if you know the way we met, raise your hand. Yeah, like almost nobody. So, Jason and I met in Adelaide, Australia. Is someone from there, or you just like the sound of the name? <laughs> um, as street performers. It was like 1999 or 2000. 2000. And March. Um, I had gone, it was before I had met, uh, or it was right after I met Brian and started the Dresden Dolls, but it was really early days. And I was still, all of my money was still coming from being a street performer. And I had been convinced by a fellow living statue who was touring and I had met in Boston that there was a lot, that the, the streets of the Adelaide fringe were paved with gold. <laughs> and, that I sh and that I should plunk down the $3,000 to go to Adelaide during fringe season and I would make hundreds of dollars a day and it was going to be amazing and it was freaks and theater and Australia. And so I took all of my savings and went to Adelaide um, and not only found myself staying in this guy's loft where he expected me to also be his lover, which made me feel really uncomfortable, um, but the money was terrible. And I got arrested by Woolworths for taking a, 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 a piece of nylon off of a display case to use for a wig cap because I couldn't find a store that sold wig caps. And the police came, took me up to the Woolworth security office and told me that they were putting me in jail. And I finally learned the power of Zen and was like, just take me. <laughs> and they were like, now we love, you can go. Um, and it was like the day after that I heard this crazy guy playing accordion like a half a block away from where I was doing The Bride. Someone who had been similarly, similarly deluded into going to <laughs> the, 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 the street performing mecca of Adelaide. It was a bad year for street performers there. Um, and, and thus began a like crazy relationship of ongoing insane serendipity, which is my friendship with this incredible man here. Um, but one of, the, one of the most interesting things about Jason and my book and my TED Talk and this whole discussion around, um, I mean, when you really want to not waste time and get down to the meat of it, like, what is art? Who makes it and why? What is it worth? and what is it worth to the people who want it, which is really kind of what a lot of the book winds up being about and what I was forced to think about and hadn't expected to think about after I did, did a Kickstarter and found myself called upon to explain to a lot of people, like, you know, what is art worth and how are you allowed to price it or not and what is this relationship between the people who want the art and the people who are making it. And I found myself coming back to Jason a lot because I was like, well, this is one of my best friends and he and I have taken really different approaches to how we run our businesses, run our lives, collect our money, even as buskers. Jason and I had a really different approach. I you know, I was not only not playing music, I was a silent statue and I had a hat at my feet and people came along and played money and Jason had told me, and I saw, when he was a busker, he didn't want to put a hat out. He didn't like the idea of people just coming in and tossing in change or to tossing in dollars. He wanted to gather an audience. I, I wanted them to, to buy, they, they could buy the CD, but otherwise if they put money in, I, I felt weird about it. I, which is strange. I, 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 I remember once the first time I ever did anything remotely street performing, like I was in high school and I came up to Folk Life and a friend of mine, I'd helped him print up, print up some t-shirts and I was, we were supposed to be business partners selling these t-shirts and I, I brought a bunch of them to Folk Life thinking I'll just sell them, you know, and, and I brought a guitar along and I sat there and I was like strumming the guitar and I had the t-shirts out and I remember somebody like coming and putting a dollar in my guitar case. And I felt really offended. Like, 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 no, 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 I am selling t-shirts. <laughs> I, I, I don't know who you think I am, but 
I didn't actually end up selling any t-shirts and they kicked me out. <laughs> but. Um, but, I mean, what's interesting is looking at, like when Jason told me that story, I was like, yeah, I mean, I, I totally get that that was your approach. Like, you know, you wanted to, the way you wanted to interact with your audience was you wanted them to stand and watch and absorb the art you were making and not be distracted by the act of like, you know, taking out their wallets and putting money in there while you were playing your songs. And then, you know, Jason would bring his show to a finale. And you mostly busked in Seattle, right? Yeah, I mean, I traveled a bit. I did, I did um, fringe, fringe festivals. Um, I, I did a bunch of them in Canada, and that's how I ended up with the great in idea Adelaide. to go to Adelaide. But in Seattle, where was the main place that you busked? Actually, you know, I, I didn't busk. I mean, I, I did at the Pike Place Market a bit. But the, the, the place that I thought was great, any aspiring buskers or people that even wanted, like, what I would always do is I'd go, and this works for any town, but, but here, go to the big, biggest university, find out when the class breaks are, <laughs> and just perform then. Like, you know, just set up in the middle of where everyone has to go and play two songs and then sell people CDs and get them on your mailing list. I mean, that, that, that was my formula. And I, oh, and also, like, like, I would go and play to, like, the captive audiences waiting in lines at Bumbershoot and at Folklife. But those have shifted a bit since you also back got, when I did it. Didn't you get kicked out of I got kicked out of everything. I got... <laughs> I, I, I mean, I, I got friend. kicked out of all... <laughs> Most, the only one that made the news, though, was, yeah, Bumbershoot. I, I got kicked out of there for climbing up on top of the fountain. Um, but... Um, but it's, it's interesting, like, nowadays... So a lot of the, the stuff that I talk about in my TED Talk and then in the book and nowadays when people come approaching me as a pundit for, like... The music industry, it's all totally fucked up. How are, you know, how are we gonna move forward? How are we gonna do this? And I keep coming back to busking as the perfect metaphor, which is, there's a million ways to do it. And what I think, you know, what I think is holding everybody back is the idea that there is this one way to do it. And the same way, you know, Jason is like perfectly happy and perfectly, um, free to interact with his audience in the street the way he wants, which is like, I'm going to draw you in for a show, have you stand there, play a finale, finale, sell you my CD, and that's the way I, Jason Webley, want to do it, and my way of doing it was differently, and my way of doing my music career is slightly different from Jason's, but we really celebrate each other's differences, like truly, I think the way Jason does things is awesome. And, you know, even lately, like a week ago, the news was exploding with uh, Taylor Swift taking her, her music off Spotify. And everyone came to me and was like, T talk to us about how evil Taylor Swift is. And I was like, I don't know, I think she's fine. I think she wants to take her music off Spotify and I think she has every right to do that. And that, like my ambivalence sort of pisses people off. I'm like, oh, she's a, I think she's fine. I think U2 is fine. I think Pink Floyd is fine. I think Nine Inch Nails is fine. I think Jason Webley is fine. Like, I think you guys are I've being really mean to list. all of the artists. <laughs> <laughs> um, but I, I mean, I really do think, uh, as with the internet culture in general right now, and everybody's sort of general addiction to like, what are we going to be outraged at this week? I'm like, maybe we can all be outraged at outrage. And, <laughs> thank you. Uh, because maybe the answer is not as sexy as you want it to be. And maybe the answer is there really are gonna be 900 ways of artists sharing themselves, sharing their music, doing their shows, and it isn't gonna be this one simple fucking black and white solution that everybody wants it to be. And I see that, I mean, I feel like I learned that deeply on the street, watching everybody's sort of weird, eco messy ecosystems. Um, and in the way, like if a, mus if a musician wants to make music and somehow connect with an audience and somehow make a living, there's so many ways to do it. And there's so many ways to tour. Um, and Jason and I both have so many weird ass friends. <laughs> 
do, doing it so many different ways. And, uh, you know, and one of the reasons I love Jason so much is like, we just don't judge, we don't judge them. They're doing it this way, it's totally weird. They're doing it this way. These people kind of are following a pop path. These people are living out of their van. These people, you know, and it's, and it's like, it's, it's all fine. And that's such an unpopular way to think nowadays. So. I judge a little sometimes. <laughs> Um, I would, I'd like to invite up our next guest. We're going to, like, like a slowly growing orgy, we're going to invite guests to the stage. Um, this beautiful woman in the ballerina costume is Ksenia, Ksenia, and, and Anska. Oh, and, my microphone and works her mic is wow. on, And she's going to flourish across the stage. And she's going to read... Thank you. So, um, well, there's so many things that we can talk about, but um, I think one of the one of the best things for the three of us to talk about is how. Um, and it's almost like I wish Neil was here, but it's almost like he's this fourth person in the room, especially after a story like that, which is some. Um, uh, why it is that when things happen to you or occur to you that you wind up thinking that it's important to make art or write fiction or write songs and um, maybe why it is that we've wound up in a strange society where it's often deemed um, like frivolous or unnecessary um, and like there are all these levels of existence and art comes like way late. Thoughts? <laughs> we talk now? Yeah, now we, now we talk. Oh, okay. And here I thought I was going to dance for you guys. Give your answer through interpretive dance. <laughs> I'm just so excited. <laughs> I get to be ballerina for two minutes. Um, coming back to, you know, why do we do art or write books or, or this. This is just being very silly. And, you know, when I was little, I really wanted to be a ballerina a dancer, and it never happened. And I got to the point where I'm almost 40, and now I write books. I'm still not a ballerina, but I wrote a book in which a girl could be ballerina. And then I got invited to my first reading at the first bookstore, and I got to dress up as a ballerina. So through doing this, writing my book, I got to live my dream, and I made people around me happy who said, wow, this is just, there's so much joy in you dancing. <laughs> And I said, can you believe it? I had to become a writer to dance in the tutu. <laughs> um, but it comes from pain, I think. It comes from understanding that you carry something and you just have to let it out. And you either hide it and you turn in on yourself and you get depressed or you commit suicide, which I came really close to at one point in my life. Or we do the outrage, you know, you, you spill it out, but then it's destruction, it's not really creating something. So I think art is just something where you create beauty out of ugliness, out of this pain that you carry and you find your medium, you know, whether it's a song or it's a story. And suddenly it becomes something that makes you instead of destroying you. And when we, when we were talking this morning, well, also, and last night, I hadn't realized that you, um, you've only recently, like, embraced fiction and being a writer, and you did it once you left Russia, came here, had a huge realization about your own past, which you can share with these people or you don't have to, 
Um, and part of dealing with that and reinventing yourself and finding a way to be happy was writing fiction. Yeah, I'm from Russia, by the way. Hello. <laughs> Anybody here was to Russia? <laughs> Only There's one? There's one Russian in the middle. <laughs> Two Russians. Okay. Yeah, I've been nursed with vodka, and I grew up playing with bears on the snowy... And I know I can't fool you, but I really love to fool people in the past. And they would listen to me for the first few minutes. They're like, wow, really? I'm like, yes, we don't have plates like this. We eat out of wooden plates with wooden spoons. This is so exciting what you guys have here in America. They're like, wow. Contributing to the stereotype, left and right. <laughs> Terrible. Um, but... Overall, what brought me to writing, which I didn't think I'd ever do, and this is not even my first language. I mean, you hear me talking. I came here about 16 years ago. I couldn't say anything. I, I knew how to say I love you because I listened to Beatles' song. <laughs> and then I knew bad words. Like I heard, fuck you was bad, and I knew that. But apart from that, I didn't know anything else. Um, and I actually studied architecture, and I never knew that I'd be writing something. Um, and then, here comes the sob story. You can plug your ears if you want to, because... Or take out your tissues. I don't think any of these people are ear-plugging types. I love you! <laughs> um, I have been having pains in my body, and... Sorry, this is going to be gross, but I started... Being blood. It was just weird because I went to my doctor and I said, hey, give me antibiotics and fix it. You know how it's treated in America usually. You go to the doctor and they give you a pill and they get you fixed, right? Well, it didn't work. I went a second time. It didn't work again. And then I went a third time. And then my immune system was like, fuck you. <laughs> and I was like, oh, I have to go pee every 15 minutes. <laughs> Oops, what's happening? Um, what was happened was that I got really happy and my body suddenly started throwing at me all this pain that I went through, which I didn't realize. And the long, long, long story short is that I started remembering things and having PTSD moments when I would just freak out in the middle of the mall. And I would try to reach out to people because I knew that I had to talk through or help some, somebody help me breathe. And people would walk around me like a weirdo. Oh, there's some weirdo over there breathing whoa, 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 I'm going to walk around you. So I felt maybe some of this statue thing you were talking about, you know, but just feeling crippled by this emotion. And then slowly images started coming back into my head and I realized, wow, I've actually lived through some violent childhood. I've been abused and I just never knew or I never thought I understood what that meant. And my body was telling me, something is wrong down there. Pay attention to me. And I went through two years of therapy. I went back to Russia because my sister was getting married, and I saw my dad, and I came back, and I was like, oh, I, my father did some strange things to me. Oh, my grandmother's husband, who's my step-grandfather, did strange things to me. Oh, it couldn't happen. No, 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 it doesn't. No, 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 no. This happens to one woman somewhere in the million, and you read a story about her in a newspaper, and you think, oh, my God, wow. I'm so glad I'm not you, but I feel so sorry for you, but that's not me. And then it was like, oh, it is me. <laughs> oh, I actually have been sexually abused. Oh, uh, that was part of my discipline. Oh, I didn't know what that means. Oh, I hate sex. <gasps> oh, both of my marriages didn't work because I didn't enjoy sex. It was just a piece of wood. Just, here's my body, take it. Oh, I've been trained to do it since I was five. Oh, I want to kill myself. I don't want to live. I, I'm done. I don't want to live in the world like this. I don't know why my dad did that to me. And then I thought, fuck it. <laughs> I'm going to go public about this. I'm going to talk about this. And I did. And my uh, therapist said, 
journal, write about it, and I started writing. And the fact that I'm Russian and I actually started writing in English unblocked something where I was tapping into this new identity. I had no history connected to, you know, my previous life. And then my friends told me, wow, you should write, you can write. I'm like, no, I can't. <laughs> They're like, yeah, you can. I'm like, no, I'm terrible. <laughs> They're like, yes, you should. And I started writing. My first book happened out of it. I really wrote for therapy. I never knew somebody would read my stuff. I never thought anybody would be interested. But somehow this pain turned into art, and what I did was I recreated myself. But I, I don't want it to sound grand like, hi, look at me. I'm so like, cool and awesome. I was broken down, and I just fixed myself. No, it didn't work like this. I had a community of people who, without whom I would not survive, my logical family, who were Twitter people, Facebook people, all these people to whom I would reach out. I'm like, wow, you guys are my new family. Yeah, well, we were talking about that this morning. The, um, it's so new, and social media is so new, and it's hard to explain. And like some of you out there may really understand this, and some of you may not understand it. but. Um, if you decide to harness it and use it as this really emotional tool, it works that way. Because it's actually just a bunch of human beings on the other side of the internet, um, and it may be a hundred Twitter followers or a million Twitter followers, but, I mean, Sang and I, and I really, when I, when I looked at her Twitter feed and looked at her, I was like, oh, you're another freak like me. Like, you're t <laughs> like really using this using this tool to be very, very genuinely yourself and honest and open and needy and giving and constantly exchanging with other people. And, um, and then the other thing that was a similarity between us when I met her, which is maybe a year ago on Twitter, this is yesterday, it was the first day we met each other in person, um, was she gives away her books for free. And, you know, a lot of people kept, right, get away. Um, and a, a lot of people were pointing at us at each other being like, you freaky rock star who gives your music away for free, freaky writer who gives her books away for free. And we've sort of bonded in, in hatred, like we've both been hated, her by the literary community and me often by the music community for devaluing art because... Um, because I don't actually really understand why. Um, <laughs> but maybe you could speak to that for a second and then maybe we yeah. can open up the conversation. So, um, what happened was because my history is so dark, I wish it was happy, you know, like you read these interviews by authors and they're like, wow, I've wanted to be a writer ever since I was five. And I'm like, not me, um, I don't know if I can talk about this because I'm used to people getting, whoa, you freak, I don't want to touch you, go away. Um, but I just, I thought, I can't, I can't sell. I owe my life to writing. Because I started writing, I decided to live, and so I give it away because to me, it's like, here, take my life, take my heart, take this, hold this something, please, in your hands that this is the reason I'm alive. I mean, just because you are reading my work, it's a miracle, I, I don't want anything. If you can just hold me when I fall back, I will fall into your hands, but please. And people are amazing. They would download a book and they would donate me 50 bucks. I'm like, whoa, <laughs> wow, thank you. It only costs 12, but thank you for 50. <laughs> and then they will donate 100. I'm like, wow. At first, it was really hard for me. Take the fucking donut, right? <laughs> Right. I was like, no, 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 you can't. And now I, I've learned, I've learned to take it. And I said, thank you. Thank you. I accept it. Thank you. And, and this is what's interesting is once you give your love away to people, they want to give back. We want to give back. We're just so scared. We, we, we can't take the first step. And when we see somebody else out there going, here, me, look, take me, we go, yes. Thank you. But it's, a, but it's a kind of a faith, like, in, and it's a lot like street performance. It's like you have to have a certain degree of faith in your fellow human beings to get out there in the first place. 
and say like, it's not that I'm for sale, it's that I'm doing a thing and I have faith in the fact that someone is gonna come by and appreciate it. And that takes, you know, it can feel really foolish and it can feel really naive, but also when it starts working, it's so much more satisfying than just doing it at a huge arm's length and sort of like giving your thing to the store and letting the store sell it for you. Um, and it doesn't surprise me that most of the, like, I mean, whatever, like my social circles, but a lot of the people I know who have kind of had this realization, a lot of them are women. Um, because, and I don't know why. I mean, I think maybe because there is, um, there's a there's a, some kind of like weird intuition in going like when you when you give a thing you get a thing back and we often you but know, then we talked about it remember about this giving and how mostly when we ask now we're like oh and give me that if you <laughs> give me that I'll give you that right well and, <laughs> and life life can devolve into this like terrible game of like you know. Yes, it's like stamp collection. It's like, um, but I don't, I don't know. It's really interesting. Like even lately, and I kind of want to bring Jason into the conversation because I'm interested to hear what he has to say about it. Um, and I'm gonna, I'm also gonna see Zoe Keating in a couple of nights, and I want to hear what she has to. She's been this advocate of, you know, similar things like going direct and um, directly, you know advocating for a fan artist relationship without using middlemen but it's incredibly messy and now that digital music is free and we can't argue about it it just is free you can get it for free pretty much everywhere we're all being forced I mean and now writers and soon filmmakers we're all being forced to go like, okay, if this thing that we are going to create is gonna be distributed for free, and I can email anybody I want a, a Jason Webley album just you know, wrapped up in a zip, what is our relationship with each other going to be to make people value what it is that we do and how are we going to live our lives, pay our rent, you know, continue on in a relationship with one another where we trust each other and and we don't have to feel foolish. I don't know. <laughs> but but I do think I do think it's interesting that like we act like it's this crazy new time we're living in and like oh my god like everything's so different than it's ever been before. The thing is it's always been a crazy new time and totally different than it's ever been before at least for the last like 120 years or so. You know like the, the, it used to be not so long ago that if you wanted to hear music, you needed to be in a room where someone was playing it. It's true. <clears throat> and, and, you know, things have changed a lot of times in a lot of different huge ways since then. And, and each generation has had to reckon with and figure out you know, and, and, and like look at with fear at like, oh my god, this, this thing can like just take this, this, you know, vibrate, send this vibration into the air and people everywhere can hear, like only one person needs to play the music and then everyone in the world can hear it. What will, all the, what will happen to all the musicians? They'll all, but, but people keep making it through these transitions and figuring out a new way to, to do it. But, you know, and we, we figured out a way during the time that was we've been here and I don't know what the hell I would do if I was trying to start now, mm. but because uh, it does look more daunting. Um. It does look more daunting, but there's also, there's this kind of fundamental faith in the, like the one thing that never changes or that I've certainly not seen change in my lifetime is that people love art. People love music. They want it in their lives. And, and yeah, I mean, like to varying degrees, people feel like they need it to nourish themselves and to feel like they have a reason to do their other job 
And I mean, I talk about this in the book, like I felt like such a kind of a waste of space and a fraud for so long going like, oh, I'm a musician, I'm kind of useless. Like everyone else out there has a real job and you're making a bridge and you're fixing a toilet and I'm just writing a song and I kind of have nothing to offer. And it was, it was through the act of like constantly signing after shows and actually physically meeting the people like you guys, the people listening to my music, and one guy being like, well, I fix toilets, but your music really means a lot to me, and like, and, and you know, this guy being like, well, I make bridges, well, I write computer programs, well, I'm a doctor, I'm a lawyer, I'm a shoe salesman, I'm a nurse, and I really hope you keep making music because I want to do this so that you can do this. And like, after years and years of hearing that, I was like, okay, I believe you. I, I have a use. <laughs> and <laughs> um, but like our, our culture in general isn't really attuned that way. Like we revere pop stars and we kind of revere art in this strange way, but we also don't really take care of our artists as if they have a use. They're sort of disposable you know, or they're kind of, like, they're kind of these strange pumped up celebrities, but only a few of them are like, oh, these are national treasures, these are people to take care of, these are people, you know, serving us. We need these guys. You don't hear people talking like that really often, the way I assume that you would in the old school where it's like, here is our village, these are the people who tell stories, we need them. These are the people, you know, here is our medicine healer, we need them. Here's the person who makes shoes. Here's the person who makes light. All of these people work in an ecosystem and they're all equally important and none of them are scaled way up or totally unimportant. All these people are important. And, um, and, it's, and it's, pretty, it's pretty weird and recorded music did definitely fuck things up. And the big question on everyone's, you know, in everyone's mind now is like, what about the shy artists who can't go out and like tweet and sell their shit and constantly blog and constantly extrovertedly, you know, Kickstarter their ways to stardom? And what about PJ Harvey now and JD Salinger now? And, you know, and like the question is, I don't know. But also, what about PJ Harvey in the time of Bach? Like, what if she wanted to make rid of me in the time of Bach? Would anyone have been her audience? I'm not sure. It's a, it, it's, a, it's a question worth asking. <laughs> no answer forthcoming from the peanut gallery. Um, let's, uh, let's take some questions from the audience. What? Your cashews, not peanuts? What does that mean? <laughs> Is that a euphemism? It means they're, they're much falling? more delicious. <laughs> Uh, what wisdom or advice do you wish someone had given to you when you were a teenager? Hmm. To not take life too seriously. I was scared of it. And to I what? Thought, to not take it too seriously. To not take it too seriously. Oh, God, that's hard. <laughs> I was so scared. I thought I had to grow up and be an adult. And here I am almost 40, and I learned that it's better to be a kid, actually. Uh-huh. What about you? I mean, uh, like, uh, real time, so a 15-year-old comes up to you and says, you, you have 15 seconds to advise me. I need your wisdom. What is yeah. it? Well, I, I, often, I, I often gave mistaken advice, I feel like, whenever a 15-year-old would be like, I want to be a, a musician and a street performer and travel around and play small shows like you do and, and make my living that way. I, I often, when people would come up and say that, I would be like... That's great. Like, maybe save up a bit of money first, or, or like, maybe like it, 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 it might not work. But, but then, like now, I like look as I'm a little bit older. It's like you know, there are so many things you could be doing in your life that are really unexciting. Do do whatever. Like you know, like if what, like whatever you want to do, just try to make it work. Like I. I don't save up any money first. <laughs> don't, don't have anything to fall back on. 
I'm sorry to every, anyone in this room that I gave the, the wrong advice to. <laughs> like, you'll figure it out. I trust you. You're 15. <laughs> I should be asking you. <laughs> totally. Yeah, I mean, I, I think the most paradoxical thing about that question is when I was 15, I, if, if some 38-year-old had come to me with any advice, I would have been like, you're old! You, you look like you're trying to be 15 and cool. I don't trust you. Um, w- one of the things that um, I have found most interesting, and I, I kind of want to ask you both, and we, we sort of started talking about it last night, and then we're going to wrap it up, but, um, and this has nothing to do with my book, but whatever. <laughs> I don't care about my book. Um, but one of the things that I did realize through the arc of writing my book, and then looking at, looking at Neil's work, and looking at the experiences I was going through after I was right, because I, like, I wound up going through a lot of really heavy stuff during my book and then after. And my book is a very non-fiction book. And I started to realize the power of fiction because you can take anything real and transform it with no responsibility <laughs> to your sources. And, you know, we were talking last night about, like, some crazy experiences you've had, like, you know, not that they're, like, having, have anything to do with your family, um, but, you know, the ability to, like, take something that you've really learned about the world, and instead of having to just, like, this is my story, like, create an entirely new story, and this is something I intellectually understood about fiction, but it really only emotionally hit me recently how sometimes you have to fictionalize because it's, it's not only safer for you as the human being making and sharing the art, but it's the most efficient way of sharing the thing you have learned with the people that you're sharing it with. And this is, again, like an old school thing of myth and, you know, some human truth that you learn. And in order to, like condense it, distill it, you turn it into a story. And I mean, where do you, and I want to ask you both the question because you're both such different art makers. Like where do you, when you, when you find an inspiration, where do you see that, like, that line between like, here it is me, Jason, my story, my experience, versus um, this is me, Jason, but I'm going to create a story for you and it's your job to, to take it and analyze it the way you want. I mean, I think it just sort of depends on what what you're building and what the moment asks for. Like, you know, just which road to take. I, you know, with, with songwriting, I've always kind of really tried to subtract myself from the equation or early, or, you know, like I try to make everything pretty abstract you know like if if there is a story behind it it's usually like a bunch of pieces of different stories that you know blend together in in my heart that i just sort of you know weave pieces of in a song in a, a way that i hope might somehow be universal as far as actual storytelling goes i i really admire people that can do that fictionalizing and and like you know to take I don't quite know how to do that with story. Mainly, maybe just, like, the, the, I think the things that happen in my life are just too crazy to <laughs> possibly think of, like, how to, you know, like, if, if, I, if I made something up that was as crazy as the things that happened, no one would believe it. Or, you know, it wouldn't be a very believable story. Like the well, stuff from last night. Wait, the, the, <laughs> well, yeah, so, I mean similar situation over here. Right? Here's what you do. He really <laughs> hates... <laughs> I need something to write with. <laughs> Sorry. It's beautiful to be a writer because if you hate someone really badly, you can kill them in a book. Yeah. 
All right. Not only can you choose the weapon, you can torture them over a hundred pages. <laughs> And then you can write them into another book and another. You can clone them. You can make them a woman or a man or an it. This, so this reminds me of something that... <laughs> this reminds me of something that, uh, that, that has come up in many conversations uh, when I've been hanging out with Neil and a bunch of writers or talking about writing, which is authors of horror. The worst offenders, like the, the people, the Clive Barkers, the Stephen Kings, like the people who write the darkest, cruelest, sickest shit. His therapy. Are the nicest people. <laughs> and, and the most like, it's, it's sort of like really hardcore death metal people are usually really friendly and nice and like always wanting to buy you a beer. And then the people who are really bitter and hard to hang out with are the romance writers. <laughs> <laughs> They're not working through their shit. <laughs> yeah, we, we have all this stuff that we carry and then we make it into dragons or rose guard that eat people, you know, or, and then we write it into a book and we cry and we just, or we scream. Like I sit alone in the room and it's just marvelous. I can use all these bad words. <laughs> I don't have to feel ashamed. <laughs> I feel awesome. That's a good note to end on. Mm -hmm. um, and then it's gone. It's gone out of me, and that's why I'm so nice right now in the tutu. <laughs> I recommend you read all of her books. <laughs> um, and uh, and listen to all of his you. albums. <laughs> and uh, with that, I would like to thank my special guest, Mr. Jason Webley. Sing on, Skip.